Chapter 10 of Army Life in a Black Regiment This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson Chapter 10 Life at Camp Shore The Edisto expedition cost me the health and strength of several years. I could say long after, in the words of one of the men, I's been a sickly person ever since the expeditious. Justice to a strong constitution and good habits compels me, however, to say that up to the time of my injury I was almost the only officer in the regiment who had not once been off duty from illness. But at last I had to yield, and went north for a month. We heard much said during the war of wounded officers who stayed unreasonably long at home. I think there were more instances of those who went back too soon. Such at least was my case. On returning to the regiment I found a great accumulation of unfinished business. Every member of the field and staff was prostrated by illness or absent on detailed service. Two companies had been sent to Hilton Head on fatigue duty and kept there unexpectedly long, and there was a visible demoralization among the rest especially from the fact that their pay had just been cut down, in violation of the express pledges of the government. A few weeks of steady sway made all right again, and during those weeks I felt a perfect exhilaration of health, followed by a month or two of complete prostration when the work was done. This passing, I returned to duty, buoyed up again by the fallacious hope that the winter months would set me right again. We had a new camp on Port Royal Island, very pleasantly situated, just out of Beaufort. It stretched nearly to the edge of a shelving bluff fringed with pines and overlooking the river. Below the bluff was a hard, narrow beach where one might gallop a mile and bathe at the farther end. We could look up and down the curving stream and watch the few vessels that came and went. Our first encampment had been lower down the same river, and we felt at home. The new camp was named Camp Shore, in honour of the noble young officer who had lately fallen at Fort Wagner, under circumstances which had endeared him to all the men. As it happened, they had never seen him, nor was my regiment ever placed within immediate reach of the 54th Massachusetts. This I always regretted, feeling very desirous to compare the military qualities of the northern and southern blacks. As it was, the southern regiments with which the Massachusetts troops were brigaded were hardly a fair specimen of their kind, having been raised chiefly by drafting, and for this and for other causes being afflicted with perpetual discontent and desertion. We had, of course, looked forward with great interest to the arrival of these new coloured regiments, and I had ridden in from the picket station to see the 54th. Apart from the peculiarity of its material, it was fresh from my own state, and I had relatives and acquaintances among its officers. Governor Andrew, who had formed it, was an old friend, and had begged me on departure from Massachusetts to keep him informed as to our experiment. I had good reason to believe that my reports had helped to prepare the way for this new battalion, and I had sent him at his request some hints as to its formation. Boston, February 5th, 1863. To Colonel T. W. Higginson, commanding 1st Regiment S. C. Vols. Port Royal, Id, S. C. Colonel. I am under obligations to you for your very interesting letter of January the 19th, which I considered to be too important in its testimony to the efficiency of coloured troops to be allowed to remain hidden on my files. I therefore place some portions of it in the hands of the Honourable Stephen M. Weld of Jamaica Plain for publication, and you will find enclosed the newspaper slip from the journal of February 3rd in which it appeared. During a recent visit at Washington, I have obtained permission from the Department of War to enlist colored troops as part of the Massachusetts quota, and I am about to begin to organize a colored infantry regiment to be numbered the 54th Massachusetts Volunteers. I shall be greatly obliged by any suggestions which your experience may afford concerning it, and I am determined that it shall serve as a model in the high character of its officers and through discipline of its men for all subsequent corps of the like material. Please present to General Saxton the assurances of my respectful regard. I have the honor to be respectfully and obediently yours, John A. Andrew, Governor of Massachusetts. In the streets of Beaufort, 
I had met Colonel Shaw, riding with his lieutenant colonel and successor, Edward Hallowell, and had gone back with them to share their first meal in camp. I should have known Shaw anywhere by his resemblance to his kindred, nor did it take long to perceive that he shared their habitual truthfulness and courage. Moreover, he and Hallowell had already got beyond the commonplaces of inexperience in regard to coloured troops, and, for a wonder, asked only sensible questions. For instance, he admitted the mere matter of courage to be settled, as regarded to the coloured troops, and his whole solicitude bore on this point. Would they do as well in line of battle as they had already done in the irregular service, and on picket, and on guard duty? Of this I had, of course, no doubt, nor, I think, had he, though I remember his saying something about the possibility of putting them between two fires in case of need, and so cutting off their retreat. I should never have thought of such a project, but I could not have expected him to trust them as I did, until he had been exactly under fire with them. That doubtless removed all his anxieties, if he really had any. This interview had occurred on the 4th of June. Shaw and his regiment had very soon been ordered to Georgia, then to Morris Island. Fort Wagner had been assaulted, and he had been killed. Most of the men knew about the circumstances of his death, and many of them had subscribed towards a monument for him, a project which originated with General Saxton, and which was finally embodied in the Shaw Schoolhouse at Charleston. So it gave us all pleasure to name this camp for him, as its predecessor had been named for General Saxton. The new camp was soon brought into good order. The men had great ingenuity in building screens and shelters of light poles, filled in with grey moss from the live oaks. The officers had vestibules built in this way before all their tents. The cooking places were walled round in the same fashion, and some of the wide company streets had sheltered sidewalks down the whole line of tents. The sergeant on duty at the entrance of the camp had a similar bower, and the architecture culminated in a praise house for school and prayer meetings, some thirty feet in diameter. As for chimneys and flooring, they were provided with that magic and invisible facility which marks the second year of a regiment's life. That officer is happy who, besides a constitutional love of adventure, has also a love for the details of camp life, and likes to bring them to perfection. Nothing but a hen with her chickens about her can symbolize the content I felt on getting my scattered companies together after some temporary separation on picket or fatigue duty. Then we went to work upon the nest. The only way to keep a camp in order is to set about everything as if you expected to stay there forever. If you stay, you get the comfort of it. If ordered away in twenty-four hours, you forget all wasted labor in the excitement of departure. Thus viewed, a camp is a sort of model farm or bit of landscape gardening. There is always some small improvement to be made, a trench, a well, more shade against the sun, an increased vigilance in sweeping. Then it is pleasant to take care of the men, to see them happy, to hear them purr. Then the duties of inspection and drill, suspended during the active service, resume their importance with a month or two of quiet. It really costs unceasing labour to keep a regiment in perfect condition and ready for service. The work is made up of minute and endless details, like a bird's pruning her feathers or a cat's licking her kittens into the proper toilet. Here are eight hundred men, every one of whom, every Sunday morning at farthest, must be perfectly presented in all personal properties, he must exhibit himself provided with every article of clothing, buttons, shoestrings, hooks and eyes, company letter, regimental number, rifle, bayonet, bayonet scabbard, cap pouch, cartridge box, cartridge box belt, cartridge box belt plate, gun sling, canteen, haversack, knapsack, packed according to rule, forty cartridges, forty percussion caps, and every one of these articles polished to the highest brightness or blackness, as the case may be, and moreover, hung or slung or tied or carried in precisely the correct manner. What a vast and formidable housekeeping is here, my patriotic sisters! Consider, too, that every corner of the camp is to be kept absolutely clean and ready for exhibition at the shortest notice. Hospitals, stables, guardhouse, cookhouses, company tents must all be brought to perfection, and every square inch of this farm of four acres must look as smooth as an English lawn twice a day. All this besides the discipline and the drill and the regimental and the company books, which must be kept rigid account of all details. 
Consider all this, and then wonder no more that officers and men rejoice in being ordered on active service, where a few strokes of the pen will dispose of all this multiplicity of trappings, as expended in action or lost in service. For one, the longer I remained in service, the better I appreciated the good sense of most of the regular army niceties. True, these things must all vanish when the time of action comes, but it is these things that have prepared you for action. Of course, if you dwell on them only, military life becomes millinery life alone. King Lake says that the Russian Grand Duke Constantine, contemplating his beautiful toy regiments, said that he dreaded war, for he knew that it would spoil the troops. The simple fact is that a soldier is like the weapon he carries. Service implies soiling, but you must have it clean in advance that when soiled it may be of some use. The men had that year a Christmas present which they enjoyed to the utmost, furnishing the detail every other day for provost guard duty in Beaufort. It was the only military service which they had ever shared within the town, and it moreover gave a sense of self-respect to be keeping the peace of their own streets. I enjoyed seeing them put on duty these mornings. There was such a twinkle of delight in their eyes, though their features were immovable. As the reliefs went round, posting the guard under charge of a corporal, one could watch the black sentinels successively dropped and the whites picked up, gradually changing the complexion, like Lord Somebody's black stockings, which became white stockings, till at last there were only a squad of white soldiers obeying the support arms, forward, march, of a black corporal. Then, when once posted, they glorified in their office, you may be sure. Discipline had grown rather free and easy in the town about that time, and it is said that the guardhouse never was so full with human memory as after their first tour of duty. I remember hearing that one young reprobate, son of a leading northern philanthropist in those parts, was much aggrieved at being taken to the lock-up, merely because he was found drunk in the streets. Why, said he, the white corporals always showed me the way home. And I can testify that, after an evening party some weeks later, I heard with pleasure the officers asking eagerly for the countersign. Who has the countersign, said they? The darkies are on guard tonight, and we must look out for our lives. Even after a Christmas party at General Saxton's, the guard at the door very properly refused to let the ambulance be brought round to the stable for the ladies, because the driver had not the countersign. One of the sergeants of the guard, on one of these occasions, made to one who questioned his authority an answer that could hardly have been improved. The questioner had just been arrested for some offence. "'Know what dat mean?' said the indignant sergeant, pointing to the chevrons on his own sleeve. "'Dat mean government.' Volumes could not have said more, and the victim collapsed. The thing soon settled itself and nobody remembered to notice whether the face beside the musket of a sentinel were white or black. It meant government all the same. The men were also indulged with several raids on the mainland under the direction of Captain J. E. Bryant of the 8th Maine, the most experienced scout in that region, who was endeavouring to raise by enlistment a regiment of coloured troops. On one occasion Captains Whitney and Heasley, with their companies, penetrated nearly to Pocataligo, capturing some pickets and bringing away all the slaves of a plantation, the latter operation being entirely under the charge of Sergeant Harry Williams, Company K, without the presence of any white man. The whole command was attacked on the return by a rebel force, which turned out to be what was called in those regions a dog company, consisting of mounted riflemen with half a dozen trained bloodhounds. The men met these dogs with their bayonets, killed four or five of their old tormentors with great relish, and brought away the carcass of one. I had the creature skinned, and sent the skin to New York to be stuffed and mounted, meaning to exhibit it at the Sanitary Commission Fair in Boston, but it spoiled on the passage. These quadruped allies were not originally intended as dogs of war, but simply to detect fugitive slaves, and the men were delighted at this confirmation of their tales of dog companies, which some of the officers had always disbelieved. Captain Bryant, during his scouting adventures, had learned to outwit these bloodhounds, and used his skill in eluding escape during another expedition of the same kind. He was sent with Captain Metcalfe's company far up the Kumbaye River 
to cut the telegraphic wires and intercept dispatches. Our adventurous chaplain and a telegraphic operator went with the party. They ascended the river, cut the wires, and read the dispatches for an hour or two. Unfortunately, the attacked wire was too conspicuously hung, and was seen by a passenger on the railway line in passing. The train was stopped, and a swift stampede followed. A squad of cavalry was sent in pursuit, and our chaplain with Lieutenant Osborne of Bryant's projected regiment were captured. Also one private, the first of our men, who had ever been taken prisoner. In spite of an agreement at Washington to the contrary, our chaplain was held as a prisoner of war, the only spiritual adviser in uniform, so far as I know, who had that honour. I do not know, but his reverence would have agreed with Scott's pirate lieutenant, that it was better to live as plain Jack Bunce than die as Frederick Altamont. But I am very sure that he would have rather have been kept prisoner to the close of the war as a combatant than have been released on parole as a non-resistant. After his return, I remember, he gave the most animated accounts of the whole adventure, of which he had enjoyed every instant, from the first entrance on the enemy's soil to the final capture. I suppose we would all like to tap the telegraphic wires anywhere and read our neighbours' messages if we could only throw round this process the dignity of a sacred cause. This was what our good chaplain had done, with the same conscientious zest with which he had conducted his Sunday foraging in Florida. But he told me that nothing so impressed him as on the whole trip as the sudden transformation in the black soldier who had taken prisoner with him. The chaplain at once adopted the policy natural to him, of talking boldly and even defiantly to his captors, and commanding instead of beseeching. He pursued the same policy always, and gained by it, he thought. But the negro adopted the diametrically opposite policy, also congenial to his crushed race. All the force seemed to go out of him, and he surrendered himself like a tortoise, to be kicked and trodden upon at will. This manly, well-trained soldier at once became a slave again, asked no questions, and, if any were asked, made meek and conciliatory answers. He did not know, nor did any of us know, whether he would be treated as a prisoner of war, or shot, or sent to a rice plantation. He simply acted according to the traditions of his race, as did the chaplain on his side. In the end the soldier's cunning was vindicated by the result. He escaped, and rejoined us in six months, while the chaplain was imprisoned for a year. The men came back very much exhausted from this expedition, and those who were in the chaplain's squad narrowly escaped with their lives. One brave fellow had actually not a morsel to eat for four days, and then could keep nothing on his stomach for two more, so that his life was despaired of, and yet he brought all his equipment safe into camp. Some of these men had led such wandering lives in woods and swamps that to hunt them was like hunting an otter. Shyness and concealment had grown to be their second nature. After these little episodes came two months of peace. We were clean, comfortable, quiet, and consequently discontented. It was therefore with eagerness that we listened to a rumour of a new Florida expedition in which we might possibly take a hand. End of chapter 10 Recording by FNH. Visit www.printandplay.co.uk. Chapter 11 of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F.N.H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter 11. Florida Again. Let me revert once more to my diary, for a specimen of the sharp changes and sudden disappointments that may come to troops in service. But for a case or two of Valeroid in the regiment, we should have taken part in the Battle of Ulysti, and should have had, as was reported, the right of the line. At any rate, we should have shared the hard knocks and the glory, which were distributed pretty freely to the coloured troops then and there. The diary will give, better than can any continuous narrative, 
our ups and downs of expectation in those days. Camp Shaw, Beaufort, S.C., February 7, 1864. Great are the uncertainties of military orders. Since our recall from Jacksonville, we have had no such surprises as came to us on Wednesday night. It was our third day of a new tour of duty at the picket station. We had just got nicely settled, men well tented with good floors and in high spirits, officers out to out stations all happy, Mrs. Blank coming to stay with her husband, and we at headquarters just in order, house cleaned, moss garlands up, camellias and jessamines in the wash-tin basins, baby in bliss. Our usual run of visitors had just set in, two Beaufort captains and a surgeon had just risen from a late dinner after a flag of truce. General Saxton and his wife had driven away but an hour or two before. We were all sitting about busy, with a great fire blazing. Mrs. D. had just remarked triumphantly, "'Last time I had but a mouthful here, and now I shall be here three weeks, when—' In dropped like a bombshell, a dispatch announcing that we were to be relieved by the 8th Maine the next morning, as General Gilmore had sent an order that we should be ready for departure from Beaufort at any moment. Conjectures, orders, packing, sending couriers to outstations were the employments of the evening. The men received the news with cheers, and we all came in next morning. February 11, 1864 For three days we have watched the river, and every little steamboat that comes up for coal brings out spy-glasses and conjectures, and does de fourth New Hampshire, for when that comes, it is said, we go. Meanwhile we hear stirring news from Florida, and the men are very impatient to be off. It is remarkable how much more thoroughly they look at the things as soldiers than last year, and how much less us home-bound men, the South Carolinans, I mean, for of course the Floridians would naturally wish to go to Florida. But in every way I see the gradual change in them, sometimes with a sigh as parents watch their children growing up and miss the droll speeches from the confiding ignorance of childhood. Sometimes it comes over me with a pang that they are growing more like white men, less naive and less grotesque. Still I think there is enough of it to last, and that their joyous buoyancy at least will hold out while life does. As for our destination, our greatest fear is of finding ourselves posted at Hilton Head and going no farther. As a dashing Irish officer remarked the other day, if we are ordered away anywhere, I hope it will be either to go to Florida, or else stay here. Sublime uncertainties again. After being ordered in from picket under marching orders, after the subsequent ten days of uncertainty, after watching every steamboat that came up the river to see if the 4th New Hampshire was on board, at last the regiment came. Then followed another break. There was no transportation to take us. At last a boat was notified. Then General Saxton, as anxious to keep us, as was the regiment to go, played his last card in a small pox, telegraphing to department headquarters that we had it dangerously in the regiment. Notebook. All very alloyed, light at that, and besides, we always have it. Then the order came to leave behind the sick, and those who had been peculiarly exposed, and embark the rest the next day. Great was the jubilee, the men were up, I verily believe, by three in the morning, and by eight the whole camp was demolished or put in wagons, and we were on our way. The soldiers of the 4th New Hampshire swarmed in. Every board was swept away by them. There had been a time when coloured boards, if I may delicately so express myself, were repudiated by white soldiers, but that epoch had long since passed. I gave my new tent frame, even the latch, to Colonel Bell, ditto Lieutenant Colonel, and to Lieutenant Colonel. Down we marched, the men singing John Brown and marching along, and Gwine in the wilderness. Women in tears and smiles lined the way. We halted opposite the dear generals. We cheered, he speeched, I speeched. We all embraced symbolically and cheered some more. Then we went to work at the wharf. Vast wagon-loads of tents, rations, ordnance, and what not disappeared in the capacious moor of the Delaware. In the midst of it all came riding down General Saxton with a dispatch from Hilton Head. If you think the amount of smallpox in the first South Carolina volunteers sufficient, the order will be countermanded. What shall I say, quoth the guilty general, perceiving how preposterously too late the negotiation was reopened. Say, sir, quoth I, 
Say that we are on board already and the smallpox left behind. Say we had only thirteen cases, chiefly varioloid, and ten almost well. Our blood was up with the tremendous morning's work done, and rather than turn back, we felt ready to hold down Major General Gilmore, commanding department, and all his staff upon the wharf, and vaccinate them by main force. So General Saxton rode away, and we worked away. Just as the last wagon load but one was being transferred to the omnivorous depths of the Delaware, which I should think would have been filled ten times over with what we had put into it, down rode the general, with a fiendish joy in his bright eyes, and held out a paper, one of the familiar rescripts from headquarters. The marching orders of the 1st South Carolina Volunteers are hereby countermanded. Major Trowbridge, said I, will you give my compliments to Lieutenant Hooper, somewhere in the hold of that steamer, and direct him to set his men at work to bring out every individual article which they have carried in? And I sat down on a pile of boards. You will return to your old camping ground, Colonel, said the General placidly. Now, he added with some serene satisfaction, we will have some brigade drills. Brigade drills? Since Mr. Pickwick, with his heartless tomato sauce and warming pans, there had been nothing so aggravating as to try to solace us, who were as good as on board the ship and under way. Nay, in imagination, as far up as St. John's, as Palitka at least, with brigade drills. It was very kind and flattering in him to wish to keep us, but unhappily we had made up our minds to go. Never did officer ride at the head of a battalion of more woe-begone, spiritless wretches than I led back from Beaufort that day. When I marched down to de landing, said one of the men afterwards, my knapsack full of feathers. Coming back, he led. And the lead instead of the feathers rested on the heart of every one. As if the disappointment itself were not sufficient, we had to return to our pretty camp, accustomed to its drawing-room order, to find it a desert. Every board gone from the floors, the screens torn down from the poles, all the little conveniences scattered, and, to crown it all, a cold breeze such as we had not known since New Year's Day, blowing across the camp and flooding everything with dust. I sincerely hoped the regiment would never behave after a defeat, as they behaved then. Every man seemed crushed, officers and soldiers alike. When they broke ranks, they went and lay down like sheep where their tents used to be, or wandered disconsolately about, looking for their stray belongings. The scene was so infinitely dolorous that it gradually put me in the highest spirits. The ludicrousness of the whole affair was so complete there was nothing to do but laugh. The horrible dust blew till every officer had some black spot on his nose, which paralyzed pathos. Of course, the only way was to set them all to work as soon as possible, and work them we did, I at the camp and the major at the wharf, loading and unloading wagons, and just reversing all which the morning had done. The New Hampshire men were very considerate, and gave back most of what they had taken, though many of our men were really too delicate or proud to ask, or even take what they had once given to the soldiers or to the coloured people. I had no such delicacy about my tent frame, and by night things had resumed something of their old aspect, and cheerfulness was restored in part. Yet long after this I found one first sergeant absolutely in tears, a Florida man, most of those kindred were up the St. John's, it was very natural that the men from that region should feel thus bitterly, but it shows how much of a habit of soldiers they have all acquired, that the South Carolina men, who were leaving the neighborhood of their families for an indefinite time, were just as eager to go, and not one deserted, though they knew of it for a week beforehand. No doubt my precarious health makes it now easier for me personally to remain here, easier on reflection at least, than for the others. At the same time, Florida is fascinating, and offers not only adventure, but the command of a brigade. Certainly, at the last moment, there was not a sacrifice I would not have made, rather than wrench myself and the others away from the expedition. We are, of course, thrown back into the old uncertainty, and if the smallpox subsides, and it is really diminishing decidedly, we may yet come in at the wrong end of the Florida affair. February 19. 
Not a bit of it. This morning the general had ridden up radiant, has seen General Gilmore, who has decided not to order us to Florida at all, nor withdraw any of this garrison. Moreover, he says that all which is intended in Florida is done, that there will be no advance to Tallahassee, and General Seymour will establish a camp of instruction in Jacksonville. Well, if that is all, it is a lucky escape. We little dreamed that on that very day the march toward Olustee was beginning. The battle took place next day, and I add one more extract to show how the news reached Beaufort. February 23, 1864 There was the sound of revelry by night at a ball in Beaufort last night, in a new large building beautifully decorated. All of the collected flags of the garrison hung round and over us, as if the stars and stripes were devised for an ornament alone. The array of uniforms was such that a civilian became a distinguished object, much more a lady. All would have gone according to the proverbial marriage bell, I suppose, had there not been a slight palpable shadow over all of us from hearing vague stories of a lost battle in Florida, and from the thought that perhaps the very ambulances in which we rode to the ball were as only until the wounded or the dead might tenant them. General Gilmore only came, I supposed, to put a good face upon the matter. He went away soon, and General Saxton went. Then came a rumour that the Cosmopolitan had actually arrived with wounded, but still the dance went on. There was nothing unfeeling about it. One gets used to things, when suddenly in the midst of the lancers there came a perfect hush, the music ceasing, a few surgeons went hastily to and fro, as if conscience-stricken, I should think they might have been. Then there waved a mighty shadow in, as in Newland's black night, and as we all stood wondering, we were aware of General Saxton, who strode hastily down the hall, his pale face very resolute, and looking almost sick with anxiety. He had just been on board the steamer. There were two hundred and fifty wounded men just arrived, and the ball must end. Not that there was anything for us to do, but the revel was mistimed, and must be ended. It was wicked to be dancing, with such a scene of suffering nearby. Of course the ball was instantly broken up, though with some murmurings and some longings of appetite on the part of some towards the wasted supper. Later I went on board the boat. Among the long lines of wounded, black and white intermingled, there was the wonderful quiet which usually prevails on such occasions. Not a sob, nor a groan, except from those undergoing removal. It is not self-control, but chiefly the shock to the system produced by severe wounds, especially gunshot wounds, and which usually keeps the patient stiller at first than at any time later. A company from my regiment waited on the wharf, in their accustomed dusky silence, and I longed to ask them what they thought of our Florida disappointment now. In view of what they saw, did they still wish we had been there? I confess that in the presence of all that human suffering, I could not wish it, but I would not have suggested any such thought to them. I found our kind-hearted ladies, Mrs. Chamberlain and Mrs. Dewhurst, on board the steamer, but there was nothing for them to do, and we walked back to the camp in the radiant moonlight. Mrs. Chamberlain, more than ever strengthened in her blushing woman's philosophy, I don't care who wins the laurels, provided we don't. February 29 but for a few trivial cases of varioloid, we should certainly have been in that disastrous fight. We were confidently expected for several days at Jacksonville, and the commanding general told Colonel Hallowell that we, being the oldest coloured regiment, would have the right of the line. This was certainly to miss danger and glory very closely. End of chapter 11 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk Chapter 12 of Army Life in a Black Regiment This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter 12. 
THE NEGRO AS A SOLDIER There was in our regiment a very young recruit named Sam Roberts, of whom Trowbridge used to tell this story. Early in the war, Trowbridge had once sent to Amelia Island with a squad of men under direction of Commodore Goldsborough to remove the Negroes from the island. As the officers stood on the beach, talking to some of the older freedmen, they saw this urchin peeping at them from front and rear in a scrutinizing way, for which his father at last called him to account as thus. "'Hi, Sammy, what you's doing, child?' "'Daddy,' said the inquisitive youth, "'don't you know Massa tell us a Yankee hab tail? "'I don't see no tail, Daddy.' There were many who went to Port Royal during the war, in civil or military positions, whose previous impressions of the coloured race were about as intelligent as Sam's view of themselves. But, for once, I had always so much to do with fugitive slaves, and had studied the whole subject with such interest, that I found not much to learn or unlearn as to this one point. Their courage I had seen before tested, their docile and lovable qualities I had known, and the only real surprise that experience brought me was in finding them so little demoralized. I had not allowed for the extreme remoteness and seclusion of their lives, especially among the sea islands. Many of them had literally spent their whole existence on some lonely island or remote plantation, where the master never came and the overseer only once or twice a week. With these exceptions, such persons had never seen a white face, and of the excitements of sins or larger communities they had not a conception. My friend Colonel Hallowell, of the 54th Massachusetts, told me that he had among his men some of the worst reprobates of northern cities. While I had some men who were unprincipled and troublesome, there was not one whom I would have called a hardened villain. I was constantly expecting to find male torpses, with no notions of good and plenty of evil, but I never found one. Among the most ignorant there was often a childlike absence of vices, which was rather to be classed as inexperience than as innocence, but which had some of the advantages of both. Apart from this, they were very much like other men. General Saxton, examining with some impatience a long list of questions from some philanthropic commission at the North, respecting the traits and habits of the freedmen, bade some staff officer answer all of them in two words, intensely human. We all admitted that it was a striking and comprehensive description. For instance, as to courage, so far as I have seen, the mass of men are naturally courageous, up to a certain point. A man seldom runs away from danger which he ought to face, unless others run. Each is apt to keep with the mass, and coloured soldiers have more than usual of this gregariousness. In almost every regiment, black or white, there are a score or two of men who are naturally daring, who really hunger after dangerous adventures, and are happiest when allowed to seek them. Every commander gradually finds out who these men are, and habitually uses them. Certainly I had such, and I remember with delight their bearing, their coolness, and their dash. Some of them were negroes, some mulattoes. One of them would have passed for white, with brown hair and blue eyes, while others were so black you could hardly see their features. These picked men varied in other respects, too. Some were neat and well-drilled soldiers, while others were slovenly, heedless fellows the despair of their officers at inspection, their pride on a raid. They were natural scouts and rangers of the regiment. They had the two o'clock in the morning courage which Napoleon thought so rare. The mass of the regiment rose to the same level under excitement, and were more excitable, I think, than whites, but neither more or less courageous. Perhaps the best proof of a good average of courage among them was in the readiness they always showed for any special enterprise. I do not remember ever to have had the slightest difficulty in obtaining volunteers, but rather in keeping down the number. The previous pages include many illustrations of this, as well as of their endurance of pain and discomfort. For instance, one of my lieutenants, a very daring Irishman, who had served for eight years as a sergeant of regular artillery in Texas, Utah, and South Carolina, said he had never been engaged in anything so risky as our raid up the St. Mary's, but in truth it seems to me a mere absurdity to deliberately argue the question of courage as applied to men among whom I waked and slept day and night for so many months together. 
as well as might he who has been wandering for years upon the desert with a bedouin escort discuss the courage of the men whose tents had been his shelter and whose spears his guard we their officers did not go there to teach lessons but to receive them there were more than a hundred men in the ranks who had voluntarily met more dangers in their escape from slavery than any of my young captains had incurred in all their lives there was a family named wilson i remember of which we had several representatives three or four brothers had planned an escape from the interior to our lines they finally decided that the youngest should stay and take care of the old mother the rest with their sister and her children came in a dugout down one of the rivers they were fired upon again and again by the pickets along the banks until finally every man on board was wounded and still they got safely through when the bullets began to fly about them the woman shed tears and her little girl of nine said to her don't cry mother jesus will help you and then the child began praying as the wounded men still urged the boat along this the mother told me but i had previously heard it from an officer who was on the gunboat that picked them up a big rough man whose voice fairly broke as he described their appearance he said that the mother and child had been hid for their nine months in the woods before attempting their escape and the child would speak to no one indeed she hardly would when she came to our camp she was almost white and this officer wished to adopt her but the mother said i would do anything but for that una this being a sort of indian formation of the second person plural such as they sometimes use this same officer afterwards saw a reward offered for this family in a savannah paper i used to think that i should not care to read uncle tom's cabin in our camp it would have seemed tame any group of men in a tent would have had more exciting tales to tell i needed no fiction when i had my fanny wright for instance daily passing to and fro before my tent with a shy little girl clinging to her skirts fanny was a modest little mulatto woman a soldier's wife and a company laundress she had escaped from the mainland in a boat with that child and another her baby was shot dead in her arms and she reached our lines with one child safe on earth and the other in heaven i never found it needful to give any elementary instructions in courage to fanny's husband you may be sure there was another family of brothers in the regiment named miller their grandmother a fine old-looking woman nearly seventy i should think but erect as a pine tree used sometimes to come and visit them she and her husband had once tried to escape from a plantation near savannah they had failed and had been brought back her husband had received five hundred lashes and while the white men on the plantation were viewing the punishment she was collecting her children and grandchildren to the number of twenty-two in a neighboring marsh preparatory to another attempt that night they found a flat boat which had been rejected as unseaworthy got on board still under the old woman's orders and drifted forty miles down the river to our lines trowbridge happened to be on board the gunboat which picked them up and he said that when the flat touched the side of the vessel the grandmother rose to her full height with her youngest grandchild in her arms and said only my god are we free by one of those coincidences of which life is full her husband escaped also after his punishment and was taken up by the same gunboat i hardly need point out that my young lieutenants did not have to teach the principles of courage to this woman's grandchildren i often ask myself why it was that with this capacity of daring and endurance they had not kept the land in a perpetual flame of insurrection why especially since the opening of the war they had kept so still the answer was to be found in the peculiar temperament of their races in their religious faith and in the habit of patience that centuries had fortified the shrewder men all said substantially the same thing what was the use of insurrection where everything was against them they had no knowledge no money no arms no drill no organization above all no mutual confidence it was the tradition among them that all insurrections were always betrayed by somebody they had no mountain passes to defend like the maroons in jamaica no impenetrable swamps like the maroons in surinam where they had these even on a small scale they had used them as in certain swamps around savannah and in the everglades of florida where they united with the indians and would stand fire so i was told by general saxton who had fought them there when the indians would retreat 
It always seemed to me that had I been a slave, my life would have been one long scheme of insurrection. But I learned to respect the patient self-control of those who had waited till the course of events should open a better way. When it came, they accepted it. Insurrection on their part would at once have divided the northern sentiment, and a large part of our army would have joined with the southern army to hunt them down. By their waiting till we needed them, their freedom was secured. Two things chiefly surprised me in their feeling towards their former masters, the absence of affection and the absence of revenge. I expected to find a good deal of the patriarchal feeling. It always seemed to me a very ill-applied emotion as connected with the facts and laws of American slavery. Still I expected to find it. I suppose that my men and their families and visitors may have had as much of it as the mass of freed slaves, but certainly they had not a particle. I never could cajole one of them in his most discontented moment into regretting old master time for a single instant. I never heard one speak of the masters except as natural enemies, yet they were perfectly discriminating as to individuals. Many of them claimed to have had very kind owners, and some expressed great gratitude to them for particular favours received. It was not the individuals, but the ownership of which they complained. That they saw to be wrong, which no special kindness could right. On this, as on all points connected with slavery, they understood the matter as clearly as Garrison or Phillips, the wisest philosophy, could teach them nothing as to that, nor could any false philosophy befog them. After all, personal experience is the best logician. Certainly this indifference did not proceed from any want of personal affection, for they were the most affectionate people among whom I had ever lived. They attached themselves to every officer who deserved love, and to some who did not, and if they failed to show it to their masters, it proved the wrongfulness of the mastery. On the other hand, they rarely showed one gleam of revenge, and I shall never forget the self-control with which one of our best sergeants pointed out to me at Jacksonville, the very place where one of his brothers had been hanged by the whites for leading a party of fugitive slaves. He spoke of it as a historical matter, without any bearing on the present issue. But side by side with this faculty of patience, there was a certain tropical element in the men, a sort of fiery ecstasy when aroused, which seemed to link them by blood to the French Turcos, and made them really resemble their natural enemies, the Celts, far more than the Anglo-Saxon temperament. To balance this, there were great individual resources when alone, a sort of Indian wiliness and subtlety of resource. Their gregariousness and love of drill made them more easy to keep in hand than white American troops, who rather liked to straggle or to go in little squads, looking out for themselves without being bothered with officers. The blacks prefer organization. The point of inferiority that I always feared, though I never had occasion to prove it, was that they might show less fibre, less tough and dogged resistance than whites during a prolonged trial, a long disastrous march, for instance, or the hopeless defence of a besieged town. I should not be afraid of their mutiny or running away, but of their drooping and dying. It might not turn out so, but I mention it for the sake of fairness and to avoid overstating the merits of these troops. As to the simple, general fact of courage and reliability, I think no officer in our camp ever thought of there being any difference between black and white, and certainly the opinions of these officers, who for years risked their lives every moment on the fidelity of their men, were worth more than those of all the world beside. No doubt there were reasons why this particular war was an especially favourable test for the coloured soldiers. They had more to fight for than the whites, Besides the flag and the union, they had home, wife, and child. They fought with ropes round their necks, and when the orders were issued that officers of coloured troops should be put to death on capture, they took a grim satisfaction. It helped their spirit to corps immensely. With us, at least, there was to be no play-soldier. Though they had begun with a slight feeling of inferiority to the white troops, this compliment substituted a peculiar sense of self-respect and even when the new coloured regiments began to arrive from the north, my men still pointed out this difference, that in case of ultimate defeat, the northern troops, black or white, would go home, while the first South Carolina must fight it out or be re-enslaved. 
This was one thing that made the St. John's River so attractive to them, and even to me. It was so much nearer the Everglades. I used seriously to ponder, during the darker periods of the war, whether I might not end my days as an outlaw, a leader of Maroons. Meanwhile, I used to try and make some capital for the northern troops, in their estimate, by pointing out that it was a disinterested thing in these men from the free states to come down here and fight, that the slaves might be free. But they were apt keenly to reply that many of the white soldiers disavowed this object, and said that it was not the object of the war, nor even likely to be its end. Some of them even repeated Mr. Seward's unfortunate words to Mr. Adams, which some general had been heard to quote, so on the whole I took nothing by the motion, as was apt to be the case with those who spoke a good word of our government in those facilitating and half-pro-slavery days. At any rate, this ungenerous discouragement had this good effect, that it touched their pride. They would deserve justice, even if they did not obtain it. This pride was afterwards severely tested during the disgraceful period when the party of repudiation in Congress temporarily deprive them of their promised pay. In my regiment, the men never mutinied, nor even threatened to mutiny. They seemed to make it a matter of honour to do their part, even if the government proved a defaulter. But one third of them, including the best men in the regiment, quietly refused to take a dollar's pay at the reduced price. We's give our soldier into de government gunnel, they said, but we won't splice ourselves so much to take de seven dollar. They even made a contemptuous ballad, of which I once caught a snatch. Ten dollar a month. Tree of dat for clothing. Go to Washington. Fight for Lincoln's daughter. This Lincoln's daughter stood for the goodness of liberty, it would seem. They would be true to her, but they would not take the half pay. This was contrary to my advice and that of their officers. But now I think it was wise. Nothing less than this would have called the attention of the American people to this outrageous fraud. The same slow forecast had often marked their action in other ways. One of our ablest sergeants, Henry McIntyre, who had earned two dollars and a half per day as a master carpenter in Florida, and paid one dollar and a half to his master, told me that he had deliberately refrained from learning to read, because that knowledge exposed the slaves to so much more watching and suspicion. This man and a few others had built on contract the greater part of the town of Micanope in Florida, and was a thriving man when his accustomed discretion failed for once, and he lost all. He named his child William Lincoln, and it brought upon him such suspicion that he had to make his escape. I cannot conceive what people of the North mean by speaking of Negroes as a bestial or brutal race except in some insensibility to animal pain, I never knew of an act in my regiment which I should call brutal. In reading Kay's Condition of the English Peasantry, I was constantly struck with the unlikeliness of my men to those therein described. This could not proceed from my prejudices as an abolitionist, for they would have led me the other way, and indeed I had once written a little essay to show the brutalizing influences of slavery. I learned to think that we abolitionists had underrated the suffering produced by slavery among the Negroes, but had overrated the demoralization. Or rather, we did not know how the religious temperament of the Negroes had checked the demoralization. Yet again, it must be admitted that this temperament, born of sorrow and oppression, is far more marked in the slave than in the native African. Theorize as we may, there was certainly in our camp an average tone of propriety, which visitors noticed, and which was not created, but only preserved by discipline. I was always struck not merely by the courtesy of the men, but also by a certain sober decency of language. If a man had to report to me any disagreeable fact, for instance, he was sure to do it with gravity and decorum, and not blurt it out in an offensive way. And it certainly was a significant fact, that the ladies of our camp, when we were so fortunate as to have guests, the young wives, especially of the adjutant and quartermaster, used to go among the tents when the men were off duty, in order to hear their big pupils read and spell, without the slightest fear of annoyance. I do not mean direct annoyance or insult, for no man who valued his life would have ventured that in presence of others, 
but I mean the annoyance of accidentally seeing or hearing improprieties not intended for them. They both declared that they would not have moved about with anything like the same freedom in any white camp they had entered, and it always roused their indignation to hear the negro race called brutal or depraved. This came partly from natural good manners, partly from the habit of deference, partly from ignorance of the refined and ingenious evil which is learned in large towns, but a large part came from their strongly religious temperament. Their comparative freedom from swearing, for instance, an abstinence which I fear military life did not strengthen, was partly a matter of principle. Once I heard one of them say to another in a transport of indignation, Ha, 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 boy, s'pose I no be a Christian, I cuss you, soul, which was certainly drawing pretty hard upon the bridle. Cuss, however, was a generic term for all manner of evil speaking, they would say, He cuss me, fool, or He cuss me, coward, as if the essence of propriety were in harsh and angry speech, which I take to be good ethics. But certainly, if Uncle Toby could have recruited his army in Flanders from our ranks, the swearing would have ceased to be historic. It used to seem to me that never since Cromwell's time had there been soldiers in whom the religious element had such a place. A religious army, a gospel army, were their frequent phrases. In their prayer meetings there was always a mingling, often quaint enough, of the warlike and the pious. If each one of us was a praying man, said Corporal Thomas Long in a sermon, it appears to me that we could fight as well with prayers as with bullets. For the Lord has said that if you have faith, even a grain of mustard seed cut into four parts, you can say to the sycamore tree, Arise, and it will come up. Though Corporal Long may have got a little perplexed in his botany, his faith proved itself by works, for he volunteered and went many miles on a solitary scouting expedition into the enemy's country in Florida, and got back safe, after I had given him up for lost. The extremes of religious enthusiasm I did not venture to encourage for I could not do it honestly. Neither did I discourage them, but simply treated them with respect, and let them have their way, so long as it did not interfere with the discipline. In general they promoted it. The mischievous little drummer boys, whose scrapes and quarrels were the torment of my existence, might be seen kneeling together in their tents to say their prayers at night, and I could hope that their slumbers were blessed by some spirit of peace, such as certainly did not rule over their waking. The most reckless and daring fellows in the regiment were perfect faithless in their confidence that God would watch over them, and that if they died it would be because it was their time that had come. This almost excessive faith, and their love of freedom and of their families, all cooperated with their pride as soldiers to make them do their duty. I could not have spared any of these incentives. Those of our officers who were personally the least influenced by such considerations still saw the need of encouraging them among the men. I am bound to say that this strongly devotional turn was not always accompanied by the practical virtues, but neither was it strikingly divorced from them. A few men, I remember, who belonged to the ancient order of hypocrites, but not many. Old Jim Cushman was our favourite representative scamp. He used to vex his righteous soul over the admission of the unregenerate to prayer meetings, and went off once shaking his head and muttering, Too much goat shout with de sheep. But he who objected to this profane admixture used to get our mess funds far more hopelessly mixed with his own when he went out to buy chickens. And I remember that, on being asked by our major in that semi-Ethiopian dialect into which we sometimes slid, How much wife you got, Jim? The veteran replied with a sort of penitence for lost opportunities, Only about four, sir. Another man of somewhat similar quality went among us by the name of Henry Ward Beecher, from a remarkable resemblance in face and figure to that sturdy divine. I always felt a sort of admiration for this worthy, because of the thoroughness with which he outwitted me, and the sublime impudence in which he culminated. He got a series of passes from me, every week or two, to go and see his wife on a neighbouring plantation, and finally, when this resource seemed exhausted, he came boldly for one more pass, that he might go and be married. We used to quote him a good deal, also as a sample of a certain Shakespearean boldness of personification in which the men sometimes indulged. Once, I remember, his captain had given him a fowling piece to clean. Henry Ward had left it in the captain's tent, and the latter, finding it, had transferred the job to someone else. 
Then came a confession, in this precise form, with many dignified gesticulations. Cap'n, I took dat gun. I put dat bun into Cap'n tent. Den I look, and de gun not dar. Then conscience say, Cap'n must hab give dat gun to somebody else for clean. Then I say, conscience, you must reason correct. Compare Lancelot Gobbo's soliloquy in The Two Gentlemen of Verona. Still I maintain that, as a whole, the men were remarkably free from inconvenient vices. There was no more lying and stealing than in the average white regiments. The surgeon was not much troubled by shamming sickness, and there were not a great many complaints of theft. There was less quarrelling than among white soldiers, and scarcely ever an instance of drunkenness. Perhaps the influence of their officers had something to do with this, for not a ration of whisky was ever issued to the men, nor did I ever touch it while in the army, nor approve a requisition for any of the officers, without which it could not easily be obtained. In this respect our surgeons fortunately agreed with me, and we never had reason to regret it. I believe the use of ardent spirits to be as useless and injurious in the army as on board ship, and among the coloured troops especially, who had never been accustomed to it. I think that it did only harm. The point of greatest laxity in their moral habits, the want of a high standard of chastity, was not one which affected the camp life to any great extent, and it therefore came less under my observation. But I found to my relief that, whatever their deficiency in this respect, it was modified by the general quality of their temperament, and indicated rather a softening and a relaxation than a hardening and brutalizing of their moral natures. Any insult or violence in this direction was a thing unknown. I never heard of an instance. It was not uncommon for the men to have two or three wives in different plantations, the second or remoter partner being called a broad wife, i.e. wife abroad, but the whole tendency was towards marriage, and this state of things was only regarded as a bequest from massa time. I knew a great deal about their marriages, for they often consulted me and took my counsel as lovers are wont to do, that is, when it pleased their fancy. Sometimes they would consult their captains first, and then to come to me in despairing appeal. Captain Scroby, Trowbridge, he advised me to come and marry dis lady, cause she have seven children. What for use? Captain Scroby can't lub for me. I must lub for myself, and I lub he. I remember that on this occasion he stood by, a most unattractive woman, jet black, with an old pink muslin dress, torn white cotton gloves, and a very flowery bonnet that must have descended through generations of tawdy mistresses. I felt myself compelled to reaffirm the decision of the inferior court. The result was unusual. They were married the next day, and I believe that she proved an excellent wife, though she had seven children, whose father was also in the regiment. If she did not, I know many others who did, and certainly I have never seen more faithful or happy marriages than among that people. The question was often asked whether the southern slaves or the northern free blacks made the best soldiers. It was a compliment to both classes that each officer usually preferred those whom he had personally commanded. I preferred those who had been slaves, for their greater docility and affectionateness, for the powerful stimulus which their new freedom gave, and for the fact that they were fighting, in a manner, for their own homes and firesides. Every one of these considerations afforded a special aid to discipline, and cemented a peculiar tie of sympathy between them and their officers. They seemed like clansmen, and had a more confiding and filial relation to us than seemed to me to exist in the northern coloured regiments. So far as the mere habits of slavery went, they were a poor preparation for military duty. Inexperienced officers often assumed that, because these men had been slaves before enlistment, they would bear to be treated as such afterwards. Experience proved the contrary. The more strongly we mark the difference between the slave and the soldier, the better for the regiment. One half of military duty lies in obedience, the other half in self-respect. A soldier without self-respect is worthless. Consequently, there were no regiments in which it was so important to observe the courtesies and proprieties of military life as in these. I had to caution the officers to be more than usually particular in returning the salutations of the men, to be very careful in their dealings with those on picket or guard duty, and on no account to omit the titles of the non-commissioned officers, 
so in dealing out punishments we had carefully to avoid all that was brutal and arbitrary, all that savoured of the overseer. Any such dealing found them as obstinate and contemptuous as was Topsy when Miss Ophelia undertook to chastise her. A system of light punishments, rigidly administered according to the prescribed military forms, had more weight with them than any amount of angry severity. To make them feel as remote as possible from the plantation, this was essential. By adhering to this, and constantly appealing to their pride as soldiers and their sense of duty, we were able to maintain a high standard of discipline, so at least the inspecting officers said, and to get rid almost entirely of the more degrading class of punishments, standing on barrels, tying up by the thumbs, and the ball and chain. In all ways we had to educate their self-respect. For instance, at first they disliked to obey their own non-commissioned officers. I don't want him to play de white man over me, was a sincere objection. They had been so impressed with the sense of inferiority that the distinction extended to the very principles of honour. I ain't got coloured man principles, said Corporal London Simmons indignantly, defending himself from some charge before me. I's got white German principles. I's do my best. If Cap'n tell me to take a man, suppose de man as big as a house, I clam hold on him till I die. Inception, I'm sick. But it was plain that this feeling was a bequest of slavery, which military life would wear off. We impressed it upon them that they did not obey their officers because they were white, but because they were their officers, just as the captain must obey me, and I the general, that we were all subject to military law and protected by it in turn. Then we taught them to take pride in having good material for non-commissioned officers among themselves, and in obeying them. On my arrival there was one white first sergeant, and it was a question whether to appoint others. This I prevented, but left that one, hoping the men themselves would at last petition for his removal, which at length they did. He was at once detailed on other duty. The picturesqueness of the regiment suffered, for he was very tall and fair, and I liked to see him step forward in the centre when the line of first sergeants came together at dress parade. But it was a help to discipline to eliminate the Saxon, for it recognised a principle. Afterwards, I had excellent battalion drills without a single white officer, by way of experiment, putting each company under a sergeant and going through the most difficult movements, such as division of columns and oblique squares. And as to actual discipline, it is doing no injustice to the line officers of the regiment to say that none of them received from the men more implicit obedience than Colour Sergeant Rivers. I should have tried to obtain commissions for him and several others before I left the regiment, had their literary education been sufficient, and such an attempt was finally made by Lieutenant Colonel Trowbridge, my successor, in immediate command, but it proved unsuccessful. It always seemed to me an insult to those brave men to have novices put over their heads on the ground of colour alone, and the men felt it more keenly as they remained longer in service. There were more than seven hundred enlisted men in the regiment when mustered out after more than three years' service. The ranks had been kept full by enlistment, but there were only fourteen line officers instead of the full thirty. The men who should have filled those vacancies were doing duty as sergeants in the ranks. In what respect were the coloured troops a source of disappointment? To me in one respect only, that of health. Their health improved indeed as they grew more familiar with military life, but I think that neither their physical nor moral temperament gave them that toughness, that obstinate purpose of living, which sustains the more materialistic Anglo-Saxon. They had not, to be sure, the same predominant diseases, suffering in the pulmonary, not in the digestive organs, but they suffered a good deal. They felt malaria less, but they were more easily choked by dust and made ill by dampness. On the other hand, they submitted more readily to sanitary measures than whites, and with efficient officers, were more easily kept clean. They were injured throughout the army by an undue share of fatigue duty, which is not only exhausting, but demoralizing to a soldier, by the unsuitableness of the rations, which gave them salt meat instead of rice and hominy, and by the lack of good medical attendance. Their childlike constitutions peculiarly needed prompt and efficient surgical care, but almost all the colored troops were enlisted late in the war, when it was hard to get good surgeons for any regiments and especially for these. In this respect, 
I had nothing to complain of, since there were no surgeons in the army for whom I would have exchanged my own. And this late arrival on the scene affected not only the medical supervision of the colored troops, but their opportunity for a career. It is not my province to write their history, nor to vindicate them, nor to follow them upon those larger fields compared with which the adventures of my regiment appear but a partisan warfare. Yet this at least may be said. The operations on the South Atlantic coast, which long seemed merely a subordinate and incidental part of the great contest, proved to be one of the final pivots on which it turned. Now all admit that the fate of the Confederacy was decided by Sherman's march to the sea. Port Royal was the objective point to which he marched, and he found the Department of the South, when he reached it, held almost exclusively by coloured troops. Next to the merit of those who made the march was that of those who held the open door. That service will always remain among the laurels of the black regiments. End of chapter 12 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk Chapter 13 of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter 13 Conclusion. My personal forebodings proved to be correct, and so were the threats of the surgeons. In May 1864 I went home invalided, was compelled to resign in October from the same cause, and never saw the first South Carolina again. Nor did anyone else see it under that appellation, for about that time its name was changed to the 33rd United States Colored Troops, a most vague and heartless baptism, as the man in the story says. It was one of those instances of injudicious sacrifice of esprit de corps, which were so frequent in our army. All the pride of my men was centred in de fuss south. The very words were a recognition of the loyal south as against the disloyal. To make the matter worse, it had been originally designed to apply the new numbering only to the new regiments, and so the early numbers were all taken up before the older regiments came in. The governors of states, by a special effort, saved their coloured troops from this chagrin, but we found here, as more than once before, the disadvantage of having no governor to stand by us. It's a far cry to lock eye, said the Highland proverb. We knew to our cost that it was a far cry to Washington in those days, unless an officer left his duty and stayed there all the time. In June 1864, the regiment was ordered to Foley Island, and remained there and on Coles Island till the siege of Charleston was done. It took part in the Battle of Honey Hill, and in the capture of a fort on James Island, of which Corporal Robert Vendross wrote triumphantly in a letter, when we took the pieces, we found that we recapped our own pieces that we lost on the Wilttown River, River, and thank the Lord did not lose but seven men out of our regiment. In February 1865, the regiment was ordered to Charleston to do provost and guard duty, in March to Savannah, in June to Hamburg and Aiken, in September to Charleston and its neighborhood, and was finally mustered out of service after being detained beyond its three years, so great was the scarcity of troops, on the 9th of February, 1866. With dramatic fitness, this muster-out took place at Fort Wagner, above the graves of Shaw and his men. I give in the appendix the farewell address of Lieutenant Colonel Trowbridge, who commanded the regiment from the time I left it. Brevet Brigadier General W. T. Bennett, one of the 102nd United States Colored Troops, who was assigned to the command, never actually held it, being always in charge of a brigade. The officers and men are scattered far and wide. One of our captains was a member of the South Carolina Constitutional Convention, and is now State Treasurer. Three of our sergeants were in that convention, including Sergeant Prince Rivers, and he and Sergeant Henry Hayne are still members of the State Legislature. Both in that state and in Florida, the former members of the regiment are generally prospering, so far as I can hear. The increased self-respect of army life fitted them to the duties of civil life. It is not in nature that the jealousy of race should die out in this generation, 
but I trust they will not see the fulfilment of Corporal Simon Cram's prediction. Simon was one of the shrewdest old fellows in the regiment, and he said to me once as he was jogging out of Beaufort behind me on the Shell Road, I's going to lead the South Cunnel. When de war is over, I's made up my mind that these year's success will never be civilized in my time. The only member of the regiment whom I have seen since leaving it is a young man, Cyrus Wiggins, who was brought off from the mainland in a dugout in broad day before the very eyes of the rebel pickets by Captain James S. Rogers of my regiment. It was one of the most daring acts I ever saw, and as it happened under my own observation, I was glad when the captain took home with him, captive of his bow and spear, to be educated under his eye in Massachusetts. Cyrus has done credit to his friends, and will be satisfied with nothing short of a college training at Howard University. I have letters from the men, very quaint in handwriting and spelling, but he is the only one whom I have seen. Sometime I hope to revisit those scenes, and shall feel, no doubt, like a bewildered Rip Van Winkle who once wore a uniform. We who served with the black troops have this peculiar satisfaction that whatever dignity or sacredness the memories of the war may have to others, they have more to us. In that contest all the ordinary ties of patriotism were the same, of course, to us as to the rest. They had no motives which we had not, as they have now no memories which are not also ours. But the peculiar privilege of associating with an outcast race, of training it to fend its rights and to perform its duties, this was our especial meed. The vacillating policy of the government sometimes filled other officers with doubt and shame, until the Negro had justice, they were but defending the liberty with one hand and crushing it with the other. From this inconsistency we were free. Whatever the government did, we at least were working in the right direction. If this was not recognized on our side of the lines, we knew that it was admitted on the other. Fighting with ropes round our necks, denied the ordinary courtesies of war till we ourselves compelled then concession, we could at least turn this outlawry into a compliment. We had touched the pivot of the war. Whether this vast and dusky mass should prove the weakness of the nation or its strength, we must depend in great measure, we knew, upon our efforts. Till the blacks were armed, there was no guarantee of their freedom. It was their demeanour under arms that shamed the nation into recognising them as men. End of chapter 13 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk Appendix of Army Life in a Black Regiment This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by FNH Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson Appendix A Roster of Officers First South Carolina Volunteers Afterwards 33rd United States Colored Troops Colonels T. W. Higginson 51st Massachusetts November 10, 1862 Resigned October 27, 1864 W. M. T. Bennett, 102nd U.S.C.T., December 18th, 1864, mustered out with regiment. Lieutenant Colonels. Liberty Billings, Civil Life, November 1st, 1862, dismissed by examining board, July 28th, 1863. John D. Strong, promotion, July 28th, 1863, resigned August 15th, 1864. Chas T. Trowbridge, promotion, December 9th, 1864, Mustered out. Majors. John D. Strong, Civil Life, October 21st, 1862. Lieutenant Colonel, July 28, 1863. Chas T. Trowbridge, Promotion, August 11th, 1863. Lieutenant Colonel, December 9th, 1864. H. A. Whitney, Promotion, December 9th, 1864. Mustered out. Surgeons. Seth Rogers, Civil Life, December 2nd, 1862. Resigned December 21st, 1863. W.M.B. Crandall, 29th Connecticut, June 8th, 1864. Mustered out. Assistant Surgeons. 
J. M. Hawkes, Civil Life, October 20th, 1862, Surgeon, 3rd South Carolina Volunteers, October 29th, 1863. Thos T. Minor, 7th Connecticut, January 8th, 1863, resigned November 21st, 1864. E. S. Stewart, Civil Life, September 4th, 1865, mustered out. Chaplain, Jas H. Fowler, Civil Life, October 24th, 1862, mustered out. Captains, Chas T. Trowbridge, New York, Volunteer Engineers, October 13th, 1862, Major, August 11th, 1863. W. M. James, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862, mustered out. W. J. Randolph, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862, resigned January 29th, 1864. H. A. Whitney, 8th Maine, October 13th, 1862, Major, December 9, 1864. Alex Heasley, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862. Killed at Augusta, September 6, 1865. George Dolly, 8th Maine, November 1st, 1862. Resigned, October 30th, 1863. L. W. Metcalf, 8th Maine, November 11th, 1862. Mustered out. Jas H. Tonkin, New York Volunteer Engineers, November 17th, 1862. Resigned July 28th, 1863. Jas S. Rogers, 51st Massachusetts, December 6th, 1862. Resigned October 20th, 1863. J. H. Thibodeau, Promotion January 10th, 1863. Mustered out. George D. Walker, Promotion July 28th, 1863. Resigned September 1st, 1864. W. M. H. Danlinson, promotion July 28, 1863, Major, 128th USCT, May 1865, now the first lieutenant, 40th U.S. Infantry. W. M. W. Sampson, promotion November 5, 1863, mustered out. John M. Thompson, promotion November 7, 1863, mustered out. Now First Lieutenant and Brevet Captain, 38th U.S. Infantry. ABR W. Jackson. Promotion, April 30th, 1864. Resigned, August 15th, 1865. Niles G. Parker. Promotion, February 1865. Mustered out. Chaz W. Hooper. Promotion, September 1865. Mustered out. E.C. Merman. Promotion, September 1865. Resigned December 4th, 1865. E.C. Robbins. Promotion November 1st, 1865. Mustered out. N.S. White. Promotion November 18th, 1865. Mustered out. First Lieutenants. G.W. Dewhurst, Adjutant. Civil Life, October 20th, 1862. Resigned August 31st, 1865. J.M. Bynaham, Quartermaster. Civil Life, October 20th, 1862, died from effect of exhaustion on a military expedition, July 20th, 1863. G. M. Chamberlain, Quartermaster, 11th Massachusetts Battery, August 29th, 1863, mustered out. G. O. D. Walker, New York Volunteer Engineers, October 13th, 1862, Captain, August 11th, 1863. W. H. Danlinson, 48th New York, October 13th, 1862, Captain, July 26th, 1863. J. H. Thibodeau, 8th Maine, October 13th, 1862, Captain, January 10th, 1863. Ephraim P. White, 8th Maine, November 14th, 1862, resigned March 9th, 1864. Jas Pomeroy, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862, Resigned February 9, 1863. Jas F. Johnston. 100th Pennsylvania, October 13, 1862. Resigned March 26, 1863. Jesse Fisher. 48th New York, October 13, 1862. Resigned January 26, 1863. Chas I. Davis. 8th Maine, October 13, 1862. Resigned February 28, 1863. W. M. Stockdale, 
eighth may and october thirteenth eighteen sixty two resigned may second eighteen sixty three jas b o'neill promotion january tenth eighteen sixty three resigned may second eighteen sixty three w w sampson promotion january tenth eighteen sixty three captain october thirtieth eighteen sixty three J. M. Thompson, promotion January twenty second, eighteen sixty three, captain October thirtieth, eighteen sixty three. R. M. Gaston, promotion April fifteenth, eighteen sixty three, killed at Coosfour Ferry, South Carolina, May twenty seventh, eighteen sixty three. Jasby West, promotion February twenty eighth, eighteen sixty three, resigned January fourteenth, eighteen sixty five. N. G. Parker, promotion May fifth, eighteen sixty three. Captain, February, 1865. W. H. Hyde, promotion May 5th, 1863, resigned April 3rd, 1865. Henry A. Stone, 8th May, January 26th, 1863, resigned December 16th, 1864. J. A. Trowbridge, promotion August 11th, 1863, resigned November 29th, 1864. A. W. Jackson, Promotion August 26th, 1863. Captain, April 30th, 1864. Chaz E. Parker. Promotion August 26th, 1863. Resigned November 29th, 1864. Chaz W. Hooper. Promotion November 8th, 1863. Captain, September 1865. E. C. Merriam. Promotion November 19th, 1863. Captain, September 1865. Henry A. Beach. Promotion, April 30th, 1864. Resigned, September 23rd, 1864. E. W. Robbins. Promotion, April 30th, 1864. Captain, November 1st, 1865. Asa Child. Promotion, September 1865. Mustered out. N. S. White. Promotion, 1865. Captain, November 18th, 1865. F. S. Goodrich. Promotion, October 1865. Mustered out. E. W. Hyde. Promotion, October 27th, 1865. Mustered out. Henry Wood. Promotion, November 1865. Mustered out. Second Lieutenants. J. A. Trowbridge, New York, Volunteer Engineers, October 13th, 1862. First Lieutenant, August 11th, 1863. Jas B. O'Neill, First U.S. Artillery, October 13th, 1862. First Lieutenant, January 10th, 1863. W. W. Sampson, Eighth Maine, October 13th, 1862. First Lieutenant, January 10th, 1863. J. M. Thompson, Seventh New Hampshire, October 13th, 1862. First Lieutenant, January 27th, 1863. R. M. Gaston, Hundreds, Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862, First Lieutenant, April 15th, 1863. W. H. Hyde, Sixth Connecticut, October 13th, 1862, First Lieutenant, May 5th, 1863. Jas B. West, Hundreds, Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862, First Lieutenant, February 28th, 1863. Harry C. West, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862. Resigned November 4th, 1864. E.C. Merriam, 8th Maine, November 17th, 1862. First Lieutenant, November 19th, 1863. Chaz E. Parker, 8th Maine, November 17th, 1862. First Lieutenant, August 26th, 1863. C. W. Hooper, New York Volunteer Engineers, February 17th, 1863. First Lieutenant, April 15th, 1863. N. G. Parker, First Massachusetts Cavalry, March 1863. First Lieutenant, May 5th, 1863. A. H. Terrell, First Massachusetts Cavalry, March 6th, 1863. Resigned July 22nd, 1863. A. W. Jackson, 8th Maine, March 6th, 1863. First Lieutenant, August 26th, 1863. Henry A. Beach, 48th New York, April 5th, 1863. 
First Lieutenant, April 30th, 1864. E. W. Robbins, 8th Maine, April 5th, 1863. First Lieutenant, April 30th, 1864. A. B. Brown, Civil Life, April 17th, 1863. Resigned November 27th, 1863. F. M. Gould, 3rd Rhode Island Battery, January 1st, 1863. Resigned June 8th, 1864. As a child, 8th Maine, August 7th, 1863. First Lieutenant, September 1865. Jerome T. Fordman, 50 Second, Pennsylvania, August 30th, 1863. Killed at Wallahalla, South Carolina, August 26th, 1865. John W. Selvidge, 48th, New York, September 10th, 1863. First Lieutenant, 36th, U.S., Connecticut, March, 1865. Moran W. Saxton, Civil Life, November 19, 1863. Captain, 128th U.S. Connecticut, June 25, 1864. Noun 2nd Lieutenant, 38th U.S. Infantry. Nelson S. White, December 22, 1863. First Lieutenant, September 1865. E.D.W.W. Hyde, Civil Life, May 4, 1864. First Lieutenant, October 27, 1865. F. S. Goodrich, 115th New York, May 1864, 1st Lieutenant, October 1865. B. H. Manning, August 11th, 1864, Captain, 128th U.S. Connecticut, March 17th, 1865. R. M. Davis, 4th Massachusetts Cavalry, November 19th, 1864, Captain, 128th U.S. Connecticut, March 17th, 1865. Henry Wood, New York Volunteer Engineers, August 1865, First Lieutenant, November 1865. John M. Seacles, First New York Mounted Rifles, June 15, 1865, Mustered Out. Appendix B. The First Black Soldiers. It is well known that the first systematic attempt to organize colored troops during the War of the Rebellion was the so-called Hunter Regiment. The officer originally detailed to recruit for this purpose was Sergeant C.T. Trowbridge of the New York Volunteer Engineers, Colonel Serrell. His detail was dated May 7, 1862, S.O. 84, Department South. Enlistments came in very slowly, and no wonder. The white officers and soldiers were generally opposed to the experiment and filled the ears of the Negroes with the same tales which had been told them by their masters, that the Yankees really meant to sell them to Cuba, and the like. The mildest threats were that they would be made to work without pay, which turned out to be the case, and that they would be put in the front rank in every battle. Nobody could assure them that they and their families would be freed by the government if they fought for it, since no such policy had been adopted. Nevertheless, they gradually enlisted, the most efficient recruiting officer being Sergeant William Bronson of Company A in my regiment, who always prided himself on this service, and used to sign himself by the very original title, Number 1, African Foundations, in commemoration of his deeds. By patience and tact, these obstacles would in time have been overcome. But before long, unfortunately, some of General Hunter's staff became impatient, and induced him to take the position that the blacks must enlist. Accordingly, squads of soldiers were sent to seize all able-bodied men of certain plantations and bring them to the camp. The immediate consequence was a renewal of the old suspicion, ending in a widespread belief that they were to be sent to Cuba, as their masters had predicted. The ultimate result was a habit of distrust, discontent, and desertion that it was almost impossible to surmount. All the men who knew anything about General Hunter believed in him, but they all knew that there were bad influences around him, and that the government had repudiated his promises. They had been kept four months in service, and then had been dismissed without pay. That having been the case, why should not the government equally repudiate General Saxton's promises, or mine? As a matter of fact, the government did repudiate these pledges for years, though we had its own written authority to give them. But that matter needs an appendix by itself. 
the hunter regiment remained in camp on hilton head island until the beginning of august eighteen sixty two kept constantly under drill but much demoralized by the desertion it was then disbanded except one company that company under command of sergeant trowbridge then acting as captain but not commissioned was kept in service and was sent august fifth eighteen sixty two to garrison st simon's island on the coast of georgia on this island made famous by mrs kemble's description there were then five hundred colored people and not a single white man the black soldiers were sent down on the bendy ford captain hallett on arriving trowbridge was at once informed by commodore goldsborough naval commander at that station that there was a party of rebel guerrillas on the island and was asked whether he would trust his soldiers in pursuit of them trowbridge gladly assented and the commodore added if you should capture them it will be a great thing for you they accordingly went on shore and found that the colored men of the island had already undertaken the enterprise twenty-five of them had armed themselves under the command of one of their own number whose name was john brown the second in command was edward gould who was afterwards a corporal in my own regiment the rebel party retreated before these men and drew them into a swamp there was but one path and the negroes entered single file the rebels lay behind a great log and fired upon them john brown the leader fell dead within six feet of the log probably the first black man who fell under arms in the war several others were wounded and the band of raw recruits retreated as did also the rebels in the opposite direction this was the first armed encounter so far as i know between the rebels and their former slaves and it is worth noticing that the attempt was a spontaneous thing and not accompanied by any white man the men were not soldiers nor in uniform though some of them afterwards enlisted in trowbridge's company the father of this john brown was afterwards a soldier in my regiment and after his discharge for old age was for a time my servant uncle york as we called him was a good specimen of a saint as ever i met and was quite the equal of mrs stowell's uncle tom he was a fine-looking old man with dignified and courtly manners and his grey head was a perfect benediction as he sat with us on the platform at our sunday meetings he fully believed to his dying day that the john brown song related to his son and to him only trowbridge after landing on the island hunted the rebels all day with his coloured soldiers and a posse of sailors in one place he found a creek and a canoe with a tar kettle and a fire burning and it was afterwards discovered that at the very moment the guerrillas were hid in a dense palmetto thicket near by and so eluded pursuit the rebel leader was one miles hazard who had a plantation on the island and the party escaped at last through the aid of his old slave henry who found them a boat one of my sergeants clarence kennan who had not then escaped from slavery was present when they reached the mainland and he described them as being tattered and dirty from head to foot and there are efforts to escape their pursuers when the troops under my command occupied jacksonville florida in march of the following year we found at the railroad station packed for departure a box of papers some of them valuable among them was a letter from this very hazard to some friend describing the perils of that adventure and saying if you wish to know hell before your time go to st simon's and be hunted ten days by niggers i have heard trowbridge say that not one of his men flinched and they seemed to take delight in the pursuit though the weather was very hot and it was fearfully exhausting this was early in august and the company remained two months at st simon's doing picket duty within hearing of the rebel drums though not another scout ever ventured on the island to their knowledge every saturday trowbridge summoned the island people to drill with his soldiers and they came in hordes men women and children in every imaginable garb to the number of one hundred and fifty or two hundred his own men were poorly clothed and hardly shod at all and as no new supply of uniform was provided they grew more and more ragged they got poor rations and no pay but they kept up their spirits every week or so some of them would go on scouting excursions to the mainland one scout used to go regularly to his old mother's hut and keep himself hid under her bed while she collected for him all the latest news of rebel movements this man never came back without bringing recruits with him at last the news came that major general mitchell had come to relieve general hunter and that brigadier general saxton had gone north and trowbridge went to hilton head in some anxiety to see if he and his men were utterly forgotten 
He prepared a report showing the services and claims of his men, and took it with him. This was early in October 1862. The first person he met was Brigadier General Saxton, who informed him that he had authority to organize 5,000 colored troops, and that he, Trowbridge, should be senior captain of the 1st Regiment. This was accordingly done, and Company A of the 1st South Carolina could honestly claim to date its enlistment back to May 1862, although they never got pay for that period of their service, and their date of muster is November 1862. The above facts were written down from the narration of Lieutenant Colonel Trowbridge, who may justly claim to have been the first white officer to recruit and command colored troops in this war. He was constantly in command of them, from May 9th, 1862, to February 9th, 1866. Except the Louisiana soldiers, mentioned in the introduction, of whom no detailed reports have, I think, been published, my regiment was unquestionably the first mustered into the service of the United States, the first company mustered bearing date, November 7th, 1862, and the others following in quick succession. The second regiment, in order of muster, was the first Kansas colored, dating from January 13th, 1863. The first enlistment in the Kansas Regiment goes back to August 6th, 1862, while the earliest technical date of enlistment in my regiment was October 19th, 1862, although, as was stated above, one company really dated its organization back to May, 1862. My muster as colonel dates back to November 10th, 1862, several months earlier than that of any other of which I am aware among colored regiments, except that of Colonel Stafford. 1st Louisiana Native Guards, September 27th, 1862. Colonel Williams, of the 1st Kansas Colored, was mustered as Lieutenant Colonel on January the 13th, 1863, as Colonel March 8th, 1863. These dates I have, with the other facts relating to the regiment, from Colonel R. J. Hinton, the first officer detailed to recruit it. To sum up the above facts, my late regiment, had unquestioned priority in the muster over all but the Louisiana regiments. It had priority over those in the actual organization and term of service of one company. On the other hand, the Kansas regiment had the priority in average date of enlistment, according to the muster rolls. The first detachment of the 2nd South Carolina Volunteers, Colonel Montgomery, went into camp at Port Royal Island February 23, 1863, numbering 120 men. I do not know the date of this muster. It was somewhat delayed, but was probably dated back to about that time. Recruiting for the 54th Massachusetts Colored began on February 9th, 1863, and the first squad went into Camp Redville, Massachusetts, on February 21st, 1863, numbering 25 men. Colonel Shaw's commission, and probably his muster, was dated April 17th, 1863, Report of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts for 1863, page 896 to 899. These were the earliest colored regiments, so far as I know. Appendix C. General Saxton's Instructions. The following are the instructions under which my regiment was raised. It will be seen how unequivocal were the provisions in respect to pay upon which so long and weary a contest was waged by our friends in Congress before fulfillment of the contract could be secured. War Department, Washington City, D.C., August 25th, 1862. General, your dispatch of the 16th has this moment been received. It is considered by the Department that the instructions given at the time of your appointment was sufficient to enable you to do what you have now requested authority for doing. But in order to place your authority beyond all doubt, you are hereby authorized and instructed. First, to organize in any convenient organization by squads, companies, battalions, regiments and brigades, or otherwise, colored persons of African descent for volunteer labors, to a number not exceeding 50,000, and muster them into the service of the United States for the term of the war, at a rate of compensation not exceeding $5 per month for common laborers and $8 per month for mechanical or skilled laborers, and assign them to the quartermaster's department, to do and perform such labor's duty as may be required during the present war, and to be subject to the rules and articles of war. Second, the laboring forces herein authorized shall under the order of the general-in-chief 
or of this department be detailed by the quartermaster general for laboring service with the armies of the united states and they shall be clothed and subsisted after enrollment in the same manner as any other person in the quartermaster's service third in view of the small force under your command and the inability of the government at the present time to increase it in order to guard the plantations and settlements occupied by the united states from invasion and protect the inhabitants thereof from captivity under murder by the enemy you are also authorized to arm uniform equip and receive into the service of the united states such number of volunteers of african descent as you may deem expedient not exceeding five thousand and may detail officers to instruct them in military drill discipline and duty and to command them the persons so received into the service and their officers to be entitled to and receive the same pay and rations as are allowed by law to volunteers in the service fourth you will occupy if possible all the islands and plantations heretofore occupied by the government and secure and harvest the crops and cultivate and improve the plantations fifth the population of african descent that cultivate the lands and perform the labor of the rebels constitute a large share of their military strength and enable the white masters to fill the rebel armies and wage a cruel and murderous war against the people of the northern states by reducing the laboring strength of the rebels their military power will be reduced you are therefore authorized by every means in your power to withdraw from the enemy their laboring force and population and to spare no effort consistent with civilized warfare to weaken harass and annoy them and to establish the authority of the government of the united states within your department sixth you may turn over to the navy any number of colored volunteers that may be required for the naval service seventh by recent act of congress all men and boys received into the service of the united states who may have been the slaves of rebel masters are with their wives mothers and children declared to be for ever free you and all in your command will so treat and regard them yours truly edwin m stanton secretary of war brigadier general saxton appendix d the struggle for pay the story of the attempt to cut down the pay of the colored troops is too long too complicated and too humiliating to be here narrated in the case of my regiment there stood on record the direct pledge of the war department to general saxton that their pay should be the same as that of the whites so clear was this that our kind paymaster major w j wood of the new jersey took upon himself the responsibility of paying the price agreed upon for five months till he was compelled by express orders to reduce it from thirteen dollars per month to ten dollars and from that to seven dollars the pay of quartermaster's men and day laborers at the same time the stoppages from the payrolls for the loss of all equipments and articles of clothing remained the same as for all other soldiers so that it placed the men in the most painful and humiliating condition many of them had families to provide for and between the actual distress the sense of wrong the taunts of those who had refused to enlist from the fear of being cheated and the doubt how much further the cheat might be carried the poor fellows were goaded to the utmost in the third south carolina regiment sergeant william walker was shot by order of court-martial for leading his company to stack arms before their captain's tent on the avowed ground that they were released from duty by the refusal of the government to fulfil its share of the contract the fear of such tragedies spread a cloud of solicitude over every camp of colored soldiers for more than a year and the following series of letters will show through what wearisome labors the final triumph of justice was secured in these labors the chief credit must be given to my admirable adjutant lieutenant g w dewhurst in the matter of bounty justice is not yet obtained there is a discrimination against those colored soldiers who were slaves on april nineteenth eighteen sixty one every officer who through indolence or benevolent design claimed on his muster rolls that all his men had been free on that day secured for them the bounty while every officer who like myself obeyed orders and told the truth in each case saw his men and their families suffer for it as i have done a bill to abolish this distinction was introduced by mr wilson at the last session but failed to pass the house it is hoped that next winter may remove this last vestige of the weary contest 
to show how persistently and for how long a period these claims had to be urged on congress i reprint such of my own printed letters on the subject as are now in my possession there are one or two of which i have no copies it was especially in the senate that it was so difficult to get justice done and our thanks will always be especial to hon charles sumner and hon henry wilson for their advocacy of our simple rights the records of those sessions will show who advocated the fraud to the editor of the new york tribune sir no one can overstate the intense anxiety with which the officers of colored regiments in this department are awaiting action from congress in regard to arrears of pay of their men it is not a matter of dollars and cents only it is a question of common honesty whether the united states government has sufficient integrity for the fulfillment of an explicit business contract the public seems to suppose that all required justice will be done by the passage of a bill equalizing the pay of all soldiers for the future but so far as my own regiment is concerned this is but half the question my men have been nearly sixteen months in the service and for them the immediate issue is the question of arrears they understand the matter thoroughly if the public do not every one of them knows that he volunteered under an explicit written assurance from the war department that he should have the pay of a white soldier he knows that for five months the regiment received that pay after which it was cut down from the promised thirteen dollars per month to ten dollars for some reason to him inscrutable he does not know for i have not yet dared to tell the men that the paymaster has been already reproved for by the pay department for fulfilling even in part the pledges of the war department that at the next payment the ten dollars are to be further reduced to seven and that to crown the whole all the previous overpay is to be again deducted or stopped from the future wages thus leaving them little more than a dollar a month for six months to come unless congress interfere yet so clear were the terms of the contract that mr solicitor whiting having examined the original instructions from the war department issued to brigadier general saxton military governor admits to me under date of december fourth eighteen sixty three that the faith of the government was thereby pledged to every officer and soldier enlisted under that call he goes on to express the generous confidence that the pledge will be honorably fulfilled i observe that every one at the north seems to feel the same confidence but that meanwhile the pledge is unfulfilled nothing is said in congress about fulfilling it i have not seen even a proposition in congress to pay the colored soldiers from the date of enlistment that same pay with white soldiers and yet anything short of that is an unequivocal breach of the contract so far as this regiment is concerned meanwhile the land sales are beginning and there is danger of every foot of land being sold from beneath my soldiers feet because they have not the petty sum which government first promised and then refused to pay the officers pay comes promptly and fully enough but this makes the position more embarrassing for how are we to explain to the men the mystery that government can afford us a hundred or two dollars a month and yet must keep back six of their poor thirteen which was promised them does it not naturally suggest the most cruel suspicions in regard to us and yet nothing but their childlike faith in their officers and in that incarnate soul of honor general saxton has sustained their faith or kept them patient thus far there is nothing mean or mercenary about these men in general convince them that the government actually needs their money and they would serve it barefooted and on half rations and without a dollar for a time but unfortunately they see white soldiers beside them whom they know to be in no way their superiors for any military service receiving hundreds of dollars for re-enlisting for this impoverished government which can only pay seven dollars out of thirteen to its black regiments and they see on the other hand those colored men who refuse to volunteer as soldiers and who have found more honest paymasters than the united states government now exulting in well-filled pockets and able to buy the little homesteads the soldiers need and to turn the soldiers families into the streets is this a school for self-sacrificing patriotism i should not thus speak urgently were it not becoming manifest that there is to be no promptness of action in congress even as regards the future pay of colored soldiers and that there is a special danger of the whole matter of arrears going by default should it be so it will be a repudiation more ungenerous than any which jefferson davis advocated or sidney smith denounced it will sully with dishonor all the nobleness of this opening page of history and fix upon the north a brand of meanness worse than either southerner or englishman has yet dared to impute 
the mere delay in the fulfilment of this contract has already inflicted untold suffering, has impaired discipline, has relaxed loyalty, and has begun to implant a feeling of sullen distrust in the very regiment whose early career solved the problem of the nation, created a new army, and made a peaceful emancipation possible. T. W. Higginson, Colonel Commanding 1st South Carolina Volunteers, Beaufort, S.C., January 22, 1864. Headquarters, 1st South Carolina Volunteers, Beaufort, S.C., Sunday, February 14, 1864 to the editor of the New York Times. May I venture to call your attention to the great and cruel injustice which is impending over the brave men of this regiment. They have been in military service for over a year, having volunteered, every man, without a cent of bounty, on the written pledge of the War Department that they should receive the same pay and rations with white soldiers. This pledge is contained in the written instructions of Brigadier General Saxton, Military Governor, dated August 25, 1862. Mr. Solicitor Whiting, having examined these instructions, admits to me that the faith of the government was thereby pledged to every officer and soldier under that call. Surely, if this fact were understood, every man in the nation would see that the government is degraded by using for a year the services of the brave soldiers and then repudiating the contract under which they enlisted. This is what will be done, should Mr. Wilson's bill legalizing the back pay of the army be defeated. We presume too much on the supposed ignorance of these men. I have never yet found a man in my regiment so stupid as to not know when he was cheated. If fraud proceeds from the government itself, so much the worse, for this strikes at the foundation of all rectitude, all honour, all obligation. Mr. Senator Fessenden said in the debate on Mr. Wilson's bill January 4th that the government was not bound by the unauthorised promises of irresponsible recruiting officers. But is the government itself an irresponsible recruiting officer? And if men have volunteered in good faith on the written assurances of the Secretary of War, is not Congress bound in all decency either to fulfil those pledges or to disband the regiments? Mr. Senator Doolittle argued in the same debate that white soldiers should receive higher pay than black ones, because the families of the latter were often supported by government. What an astounding statement of fact is this! In the white regiments in which I was formerly an officer, the Massachusetts 51st, nine-tenths of the soldiers' families, in addition to the pay and bounties, drew regularly their state aid. Among my black soldiers, with half pay and not a bounty, not a family receives any aid. Is there to be no limit, no end to the injustice we heap upon this unfortunate people? Cannot even the fact of their being in arms for the nation, liable to die any day in its defence, secure them ordinary justice? Is the nation so poor and so utterly demoralized by its pauperism that after it has had the lives of these men, it must turn round to filch six dollars of the monthly pay which the Secretary of War promised to their widows? It is even so, if the excuses of Mr. Fressenden and Mr. Doolittle are to be accepted by Congress and by the people. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, T. W. Higginson, Colonel Commanding 1st S.C. Volunteers. New Victories and Old Wrongs to the editors of the Evening Post. On the 2nd of July, at James Island, South Carolina, a battery was taken by three regiments under the following circumstances. The regiments were the 103rd New York, White, the 53rd United States, formerly South Carolina Volunteers, and the 55th Massachusetts, the two last being colored. They marched as one a.m. by the flank, in the above order, hoping to surprise the battery. As usual, the rebels were prepared for them, and opened upon them as they were deep in one of those almost impassable southern marshes. The 103rd New York, which had previously been in twenty battles, was thrown into confusion. The 33rd United States did better, being behind. The 55th Massachusetts, being in the rear, did better still. All three formed in line when Colonel Hartwell, commanding the brigade, gave the order to retreat. The officer commanding the 55th Massachusetts, either misunderstanding the order or hearing it countermanded, ordered his regiment to charge. This order was at once repeated by Major Trowbridge, commanding the 33rd United States, and by the commander of the 103rd New York, so that the three regiments reached the fort in reversed order. The colour-bearers of the 33rd United States and of the 55th Massachusetts had a race to be the first in, the latter winning. The 103rd New York entered the battery immediately after. 
these colored regiments are two of the five which were enlisted in south carolina and massachusetts under the written pledge of the war department that they should have the same pay and allowances as white soldiers that pledge has been deliberately broken by the war department or by congress or by both except as to the short period since new year's day every one of those killed in action from these two colored regiments under a fire before which the veterans of twenty battles recoiled died defrauded by the government of nearly one half his petty pay mr fessenden who defeated in the senate the bill for the fulfilment of the contract with these soldiers is now secretary of the treasury was the economy of saving six dollars per man worth to the treasury the ignominy of the repudiation mr stevens of pennsylvania on his triumphal return to his constituents used to them this language he had no doubt whatever as to the final result of the present contest between liberty and slavery the only doubt he had was whether the nation had yet been satisfactorily chastised for their cruel oppression of a harmless and long-suffering race insomuch as it was mr stevens himself who induced the house of representatives most unexpectedly to all to defeat the senate bill for the fulfilment of the national contract with these soldiers i should think he had excellent reasons for the doubt very respectfully t w higginson colonel first south carolina volunteers now thirty third u s july tenth eighteen sixty four to the editor of the new york tribune no one can possibly be so weary of reading of the wrongs done by the government towards the colored soldiers as am i of writing about them this is my only excuse for intruding upon your columns again by an order of the war department dated first august eighteen sixty four it is at length ruled that colored soldiers shall be paid the full pay of soldiers from date of enlistment provided they were free on april nineteenth eighteen sixty one not otherwise and this distinction is to be noted on the pay rolls in other words if one half of a company escaped from slavery on april eighteenth eighteen sixty one they are to be paid thirteen dollars per month and allowed three dollars and half per month for clothing if the other half were delayed two days they receive seven dollars per month and are allowed three dollars per month for precisely the same articles of clothing if one of the former class is made first sergeant u s pay is put up to twenty one dollars per month but if he escaped two days later his pay is estimated at seven dollars it had not occurred to me that anything could make the pay-rolls of these regiments more complicated than at present or the men more rationally discontented i had not the ingenuity to imagine such an order yet it is no doubt in accordance with the spirit if not with the letter of the final bill which was adopted by congress under the lead of mr taddeus stevens the ground taken by mr stevens apparently was that the country might honorably save a few dollars by docking the promised pay of these colored soldiers whom the war had made free but the government should have thought this through before it made a contract with these men and received their services when the war department instructed brigadier general saxton august twenty fifth eighteen sixty two to raise five regiments of negroes in south carolina it was known very well that the men so enlisted had only recently gained their freedom but the instruction said the persons so received into service and their officers to be entitled to and receive the same pay and rations as those are allowed by law to volunteers in the service of this passage mr solicitor whiting wrote to me i have no hesitation in saying that the faith of the government was thereby pledged to every officer and soldier enlisted under that call where is that faith of the government now the men who enlisted under the pledge were volunteers every one they did not get their freedom by enlisting they had it all ready they enlisted to serve the government trusting to its honor now the nation turns upon them and says your part of the contract is fulfilled we have had your services if you can show that you had previously been free for a certain length of time we will fulfill the other side of the contract if not we repudiate it help yourselves if you can in other words a freedman since april nineteenth eighty sixty one has no rights which a white man is bound to respect he is incapable of making a contract no man is bound by a contract made with him any employer following the example of the united states government may make with him a written agreement receive his services and then withhold the wages he has no motive to honest industry or to honesty of any kind he is virtually a slave and nothing else to the end of time under this order the greater part of the massachusetts colored regiments will get their pay at last and be able to take their wives and children out of the almshouses to which as governor andrew informs us the gracious charity of the nation has consigned so many 
for so much i am grateful but towards my regiment which has been in service and under fire months before a northern colored soldier was recruited the policy of repudiation has at last been officially adopted there is no alternative to the officers of south carolina regiments but to wait for another session of congress and meanwhile if necessary act as executioners for those soldiers who like sergeant walker refuse to fulfill their share of a contract where the government has openly repudiated the other share if a year's discussion however has at length secured the arrears of pay for the northern colored regiments possibly two years may secure it for the southern t w higginson colonel first south carolina volunteers now thirty third u s august twelfth eighteen sixty four to the editor of the new york tribune sir an impression seems to prevail in the newspapers that the lately published opinion of attorney general bates dated in july last at length secures justice to the colored soldiers in respect to arrears of pay this impression is a mistake that opinion does indeed show that there was never any excuse for refusing them justice but it does not of itself secure justice to them it logically covers the whole ground and was doubtless intended to do so but technically it can only apply to those soldiers who were free at the commencement of the war for it was only about these that the attorney-general was officially consulted under this decision the northern colored regiments have already got their arrears of pay and those few members of the southern regiments who were free on april nineteenth eighteen sixty one but in the south carolina regiments this only increases the dissatisfaction among the remainder who volunteered under the same pledge of full pay from the war department and who do not see how the question of their status at some antecedent period can affect an express contract if in eighteen sixty two they were free enough to make a bargain with they were certainly free enough to claim its fulfilment the unfortunate decision of mr solicitor whiting under which all our troubles arose is indeed superseded by the reasoning of the attorney-general but unhappily this does not remedy the evil which is already embodied in an act of congress making the distinction between those who were and those who were not free on april nineteenth eighteen sixty one the question is whether those who were not free at the breaking out of the war are still to be defrauded after the attorney-general has shown that there is no excuse for defrauding them i call it defrauding because it is not a question of abstract justice but of the fulfilment of an express contract i have never met with a man whatever might be his opinions as to the enlistment of colored soldiers who did not admit that if they had volunteered under the direct pledge of full pay from the war department they were entitled to every cent of it that these south carolina regiments had such direct pledge is undoubted for it still exists in writing signed by the secretary of war and has never been disputed it is therefore the plain duty of congress to repeal the law which discriminates between different classes of colored soldiers or at least to so modify it as to secure the fulfillment of the actual contracts until this is done the nation is still disgraced the few thousand dollars in question are nothing compared with the absolute wrong done and the discredit it has brought both here and in europe upon the national name t w higginson late colonel first south carolina volunteers now thirty third u s Newport, Rhode Island, December 8, 1864. Petition To the Honorable Senate and House of Representatives of the United States in Congress assembled. The undersigned respectfully petitions for the repeal of so much of Section 4 of the Act of Congress making appropriations for the Army and approved July 4, 1864, as makes a distinction in respect to pay due between those colored soldiers who were free on or before april nineteenth eighteen sixty one and those who were not free until a later date or at least that there may be such legislation as to secure the fulfillment of the pledges of full pay from a date of enlistment made by direct authority of the war department to the colored soldiers of south carolina on the faith of which pledges they enlisted thomas wentworth higginson late colonel first south carolina volunteers now thirty third u s Newport, Rhode Island, December ninth, eighteen sixty four. Appendix E Farewell Address of Lieutenant Colonel Trowbridge. Headquarters, thirty third United States Colored Troops, late first South Carolina Volunteers, Morris Island, South Carolina. February ninth, eighteen sixty six, General Orders number one. Comrades, 
the hour is at hand when we must separate forever and nothing can take from us the pride we feel when we look back upon the history of the first south carolina volunteers the first black regiment that ever bore arms in defence of freedom on the continent of america on the ninth day of may eighteen sixty two at which time there was nearly four millions of your race in bondage sanctioned by the laws of the land and protected by our flag on that day in the face of floods of prejudice that well-nigh deluged every avenue to manhood and true liberty you came forth to do battle for your country and your kindred for long and weary months without pay or even privilege of being recognized as soldiers you labored on only to be disbanded and sent to your homes without even a hope of reward and when our country necessitated by the deadly struggle with armed traitors finally granted you with opportunity again to come forth in defence of the nation's life the clarity with which you responded to the call gave abundant evidence of your readiness to strike a manly blow for the liberty of your race and from that little band of hopeful trusting and brave men who gathered at camp saxton on port royal island in the fall of eighteen sixty two amidst the terrible prejudices that then surrounded us has grown an army of a hundred and forty thousand black soldiers whose valour and heroism has won your race a name which will live as long as the undying pages of history shall endure and by whose efforts united with those of the white man armed rebellion has been conquered the millions of bondmen have been emancipated and the fundamental law of the land has been so altered as to remove forever the possibility of human slavery being re-established within the borders of redeemed america the flag of our fathers restored to its rightful significance now floats over every foot of our territory from maine to california and beholds only free men the prejudices which formerly existed against you are well nigh rooted out soldiers you have done your duty and acquitted yourselves like men who actuated by such ennobling motives could not fail and as the result of your fidelity and obedience you have won your freedom and oh how great the reward it seems fitting to me that the last hours of our existence as a regiment should be passed amidst the unmarked graves of your comrades at fort wagner near you rest the bones of colonel shaw buried by an enemy's hand in the same grave with his black soldiers who fell at his side where in future your children and children's children will come on pilgrimages to do homage to the ashes of those who fell in this glorious struggle the flag which was presented to us by rev george b Sheever and his congregation of new york city on the first of january eighteen sixty three the day when lincoln's immortal proclamation of freedom was given to the world and which you have borne so nobly through the war is now to be rolled up forever and deposited in our nation's capital and while there it shall rest with the battles in which you have participated inscribed upon its folds it will be a source of pride to us all to remember that it has never been disgraced by a cowardly faltering in the hour of danger or polluted by a traitor's touch now that you are to lay aside your arms and return to the peaceful avocations of life i abjure you by the associations and history of the past and the love you bear for your liberties to harbour no feelings of hatred towards your former masters but to seek in the paths of honesty virtue sobriety and industry and by willing obedience to the laws of the land to grow up to the full stature of american citizens the church the schoolhouse and the right forever to be free are now secured to you and every prospect before you is full of hope and encouragement the nation guarantees to you full protection and justice and will require from you in every return the respect for the laws and orderly deportment which will prove to every one your right to have all the privileges of free men to the officers of your regiment i would say your toils are ended your mission is fulfilled and we separate forever the fidelity patience and patriotism with which you have discharged your duties to your men and to your country entitle you to a far higher tribute than any words of thankfulness which i can give you from the bottom of my heart you will find your reward in the proud conviction that the cause for which you have battled so nobly has been crowned with abundant success officers and soldiers of the thirty-third united states colored troops once the first south carolina volunteers i bid you all farewell by order of lieutenant colonel c t trowbridge commanding regiment e w hyde lieutenant and acting adjutant End of appendix. Recording by FNH, 
visit www.bookranger.co.uk.